Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting episode of Pro Wrestling Uncut. Today, I guess I am your host, Cole Dawson, here with my man, Tiger Man Dave Smith, and DJ Barbecue, Charles. How you doing, Charles? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm great. Really now, excited. Now, see, this is a, uh, this is a, a change of uh, events where Charles is usually our host. And I would call him the, the host of the most, except it's trademarked and it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Tiger Man. Well, today we got a little bit something special. We are talking about the second uh, division, the Dreamer division in the Retrosoft Indie Man Indie Mania 32 Man Tournament, where we are going to pick a fantastic independent wrestler to be in their brand new video game, Retro Mania Wrestling. And, uh,. Today we got a little special help. Um, I pulled some strings, dug into my uh, sister and brother-in-law's uh, uh, phone book, and uh, found us a wrestler who is in this. He's a fantastic uh, independent wrestler, incredible promo, and uh, was part of one of my favorite wrestling podcasts of all time. Everyone should check it out. Gregory Iron on the Stone Cold Steve Austin podcast. Gregory, how are you doing today? I'm good. Uh, thanks for that uh, tremendous introduction. I appreciate it. Well, yes, you. I, I gotta say uh, on the air, I like to. At this point in my life, I like to be honest and tell people you you uh, you got me a little emotional listening to that episode, hearing about your story and your life. Uh, you're you're just a fantastic human, um, and your story really is inspiring. So, for the people out there listening to this that might not know who you are. Could you introduce yourself and uh, maybe try to win some votes? Well, um, I, uh, I'm the only professional wrestler competing with cerebral palsy, which is a, a neurological disability that I was born with. Um, I was a month premature when I was born, back uh, way back in 1986, and uh, I was about one pound. I almost died uh, choking on my own stool, and uh, the, do the doctors don't know um, – whether or not I technically had cerebral palsy uh, before or after that I entered the womb, but there's a good chance that it was uh, after because uh, a lot of the times it could happen from lack of oxygen in the brain, which, of course, I had. And being premature didn't help and all those things, and my mom was into a lot of drugs and things of that nature. But basically, with this neurological disability, there's various forms of cerebral palsy. Some people have more severe um, conditions than I do. Uh, some people are bound to a wheelchair or have speech problems or have uh, no function in both of their arms or one of their arms or their legs. My case is it's technically my whole right side, but it's most noticeable in my right arm, hand, and fingers. And uh, despite this disability and despite people telling me that I couldn't live my dreams, uh, I grew up and I said, F it, I'm going to be a pro wrestler anyways and try it. And uh, I mean, 13 years into it, I'm still doing it. So I guess I'm uh, pretty much cut out for that dreamer division here in the video game. <laughs> yes, uh, a aptly uh, uh, picked there. Um, so <clears throat> what was it that drew you to the wrestling business? Uh, at, at when, wh About what age did you get into the wrestling business? Uh, I, mean, I, um, I mean, I watched wrestling as far as I can remember. My first memories are um, – I've talked about a lot of other podcasts. My, my grandma is the one that got me into professional wrestling, and she had a um, – she was really religious, and she had all these uh, religious knickknacks, and uh, she kept them in this glass case. And sometimes when I would get bored watching cartoons or whatever, I'd walk over to this glass case and just kind of examine the knickknacks and stuff. I don't know. It was just something I did as a kid. And um, amongst these knickknacks, there was this – overly tan orange muscular man with a yellow t-shirt and bandana and a skullet and a blonde mustache and um, 
uh, I grabbed it out of the case, and uh, it turned out it was a shampoo bottle of Hulk Hogan. And uh, I didn't know what a Hulk Hogan was, so I asked my grandma about it, and she showed me some wrestling. And uh, I don't re- remember exactly what I watched, but um, the, the first memory that is vivid following that is uh, WrestleMania Six, which was, you know, Sky Dome. Uh, 67,678 people in attendance for the ultimate challenge, Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior title for title. And uh, after that match and seeing Hogan... Uh, I was hooked, and for me, um, I guess it was it was getting lost in those larger than life characters, and and Hulk Hogan was so inspiring to me as far as like telling me to say my prayers and eat my vitamins and believe in myself. And I think you know th- that's not unique to anyone specifically. I think that that message resonated with a lot of kids my age around that era. Um, but I think more so as my personal life became filled with more turmoil as far as like not only am I being made fun of in school for this disability that I have, but I don't have the best parents. Um, my, my mom, as I kind of mentioned, she was really into drugs, and uh, my dad liked to dabble in the drinking, and they butted heads a lot of the time, so I had to watch a lot of physical and men- mental abuse between my parents, and then that abuse was put onto myself and my brother. And so for me, getting lost in those larger-than-life characters – became a real escape. You know, it didn't matter how bad things were going in my personal life or if, if I was getting evicted from a house or my mom was doing drugs or abusing me. Uh, if I could get in front of the TV and watch wrestling or watch my wrestling tapes or read a magazine or play with uh, the action figures that I had and just forget about my problems for a little bit, like that was my escape. That kept me going. And uh, I think when I lost my grandma at eight to cancer, um, because of that connection that I had with her and through wrestling, I, I feel like it made me latch on to wrestling um, stronger, but I never really thought that I'd be able to be a part of the business as a wrestler. Now, Gregory, did you uh, grow up playing the uh, wrestling video games as a kid? I did. Uh, now, uh, obviously I have, you know, limited function on my right hand, but um, uh, the, the controllers, um, with the exception of, uh, I'm sure you guys remember the original Xbox controller that was overly big and lunky. Um, I could never use that controller as I got older. Um, it just didn't work for my hand because um, with my disability, I guess to describe it a little more, it's like um, since my, 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 my muscles are tightened in my right arm, but I can kind of mold and shape my fingers to kind of adapt to, uh, to certain things like weightlifting or controllers, if that makes sense. And so um, the smaller controllers, when I got started, like Nintendo and Super Nintendo and Sega, like I was able to, uh, I have enough function that I can use my thumb and hold with my left hand to, to play video games. So um, depending on the era, uh, I, I think the, the first wrestling game that I really got into was uh, Super WrestleMania. I mean, that was like, I think that's like my ideal time frame as far as uh, pro wrestling fandom, like obviously the Attitude Era was great, but um, there's just something about the WWF in 1991 and 92 and 93 that I'm really drawn to. So Super WrestleMania was really the first uh, WWF game, wrestling game in general that I got into. And then um, I remember being really pumped uh, Christmas of 94, I believe it was, to get WWF Raw, which was basically the same as Super WrestleMania, just with some additional characters. Uh, But those were the first games I really got into. Then obviously, you know, when you talk about the video game progression and uh, Nintendo 64, you know, you can't not talk about uh, the WCW games, WCW, NWO, World Tour, uh, Revenge, and then, of course, you know, WrestleMania 2000 and No Mercy. And then uh, the the last games that I really got into uh, during my fandom was really, uh, and I think, I think, um, they got too complicated for me after this, quite frankly. Uh, I really loved SmackDown Shut Your Mouth and SmackDown Here Comes the Pain for PlayStation 2. I remember coming home from school in, like, I think ninth grade, and my brother was really into, like, um, a lot of those RPG games. So it was a matter of, like, if I get home before my brother does, I can get control over the PlayStation, and that means I can play SmackDown or Here Comes the Pain, whatever was out at the time, and uh, I had free reign, so he had to suffer and watch me play these games and, and wait his turn. So I, I would skip my last period class to make sure that I had a 45 minute head start <laughs> and I could jump <laughs> on the PlayStation to play those games. Like I was super addicted to them. 
you and me, man, that, that, that's, that's me too. You know, that, that's my era of wrestling too, man. Yeah. So, so that, that's really, that, that's really awesome to me, man. Like, uh, especially raw when, when, when that came out, that was amazing. Cause you could like really hit them with weapons and stuff. Oh yeah. I, yeah. The, the, I think the that was the, the uh, yeah, I think that was like the first game that really had that. So on that note, what does it make, how does it make you feel that, that you have a chance to be on this video game? I mean, I'm super excited, and, and I, um, I mean, there's so many things that um, have happened in my career. Like, um, you know, obviously we're in 2020 now, and a lot of people are doing their um, 2019 in review, or they were doing a whole decade in review. And to be honest, my 2019 was a roller coaster, especially personally, but professionally, I feel like it was one of the strongest I've ever had. And um, I didn't write one of those year in reviews or. 10 year in review because I feel like I might get real rambly, but um, there's a lot of things that I look back that I've done in wrestling, uh, especially when you go back to the decade prior when I started and people thought it wasn't possible for me, me to make wrestling with a neurological disability work. And then to think that over the last 10 years, um, you know, I think the most successful wrestlers are the ones that are the most humble. And I like to think I'm a pretty humble guy. Um, because I still look at the things that I do while I look at it from a professional aspect and I'm a student of the game, I'm still a fan. And I still have those moments where I'm like, whoa, like I can't believe I did that. Like when I look back on the last 10 years, the caliber of, of talent that I've worked with and uh, kept up with and the things that I've done, like, um, you know, obviously he's my best friend in the world. Uh, the matches I've had with Johnny Gargano and Matt Cross and, you know, uh, Cole, I've been in there with with Candice LeRae several times, and uh, yes, I, by I, far I, the best wrestler you've ever been in a ring with, right? Uh, well, <laughs> well, 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 you know, I, I, I uh, I'm not even saying this just because she's my friend. Like, I, I was so upset when um, she wasn't signed right away uh, when Johnny was signed, just because like uh, having worked with her. Um, and especially with uh, intergender wrestling being so popular, like she's so incredible at psychology and I legitimately think she's the best women's wrestler in the world. So like for her to like not get her due for so long was like very frustrating for me, but like, I'm, I'm not going to ramble about Candace though, but like, um, <laughs> no, I but, do enough of that for everybody. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. uh, but like, that's but, our like, whole basis for a podcast is Cole yeah, bragging yeah. about Candace. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you should, but like, uh, just, just thinking about like the things that I've done uh, in the last decade, like um, the moment I had in 2011 being publicly endorsed by CM Punk and, and Cole Cabana and um, <laughs> working with guys like Rhino and Gangrel and Vader, you know, guys that I grew up watching and Shane Douglas. I, I just wrestled uh, Tommy Dreamer a few weeks ago, and I remember going to an indie show specifically because Tommy Dreamer was on it and uh, teaming with my – my uh, childhood hero, Zach Gowan, on a regular basis. And now that he's one of my closest friends in the world. And, um, and, and as you alluded to in the beginning, um, sitting at Stone Cold Steve Austin's house on two occasions and doing podcasts with him and like ha being on a peer to peer level with arguably uh, the greatest wrestler of all time. Like those things are incredibly surreal to me. And so um, as, as long winded as I'm getting here to think that now, like, I have an opportunity to not only be in a video game, but the way that I, I uh, put it online and I really sat back and thought about it, I, I could be the first wrestler with a physical disability uh, to be in a, in a professional wrestling game. And, and some people had alluded to, well, wasn't Kerry Von Eric in a wrestling game? Yeah, dickheads, he was in a wrestling game, but <laughs> he didn't acknowledge that he had a disability and it didn't affect the way that character performed in the game. Right? And they never put Gowan in a game. So I think like, um, I think it would be interesting and humbling not only to get a chance to be in a video game because I, mean, I, I, I mean, in my head, when I look in the mirror, I'm just me. Who would want to play as me? But I think um, when you look at the big picture, um, just for people with disabilities in general and just people that – um, the underdogs out there in the world, quite frankly, that think that things aren't possible to see a character like me appear in a video game. I think that could be a pretty cool opportunity, quite frankly. You know, Gregory, um, I don't know if, if Cole explained this, but we we're going to have you on here to uh, discuss, you know, the whole brackets and stuff. Yeah. But I, I'm going to use my poll right now as one third of the hosts on this. And I'm going <laughs> to sure. say, I'm going to say, 
let's not talk about that. I want to take this time to like <laughs> just hear about you. And okay. I personally want to make you our uh, our endorsed wrestler in this competition because you're incredible and your story is amazing. And I really want to make this happen. And I, after hearing your story, I don't want to talk about anyone else in this video game except you. <laughs> is that, I mean, that's okay I'm <laughs> is, is, is that okay with you, Charles? Well, uh, <laughs> we don't want to make RetroSoft <laughs> Studios mad at us. <laughs> see, 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 Mr. Iron, th there's a little inside joke with that. Uh, and they've been begging and begging to get that in with the podcast. And then, you know, Cole yeah. pull, pulled it and, and, and put it in there. Um, yeah, oh, I mean, if we're going to have a guest on there, I mean, I have the bracket up that shows <laughs> uh, you're, you're the number three seed. Uh, going against the number six seed, Steve Miggs. Um, just a little bit, I'd like to know, like, what has this done to change um, your wrestling career right now? Because, I mean, this is huge. Because I have never heard of any independent wrestlers ever being or getting a chance in a video game. But first, we're going to need your answer, Charles. Is this is this okay with you? <laughs> is it okay with me? Uh, from your previous conversations, I don't think I have the right to endorse anybody because of my 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 uh, next, record. Next That's correct. That's correct. That Charles record. cannot endorse anyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to give Johnny Gargano another, you know, concussion. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> but is that okay with you, Cole and Gregory? If uh, we do well, that for you. Uh, there is one guy who is in your bracket that I thought you might uh, have a little insight to. I think you know him. He's the number one seed in your bracket, uh, Matt Cross. You know that guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, you know, I, I. First of all, I, I love Steve Miggs. I just worked with him in uh, Seattle a couple months back, and uh, uh, he has an inspiring story himself. Uh, as far as you know, he's in his 40s. Uh, he's a disc jockey in Seattle, and uh, he kind of had the odds against him as far as like becoming a wrestler too, especially at his age. And uh, not only is he uh, blossoming into a great professional wrestler, uh, he's great on the mic, and uh, he has a lot of great ideas as far as psychology, and he's got great timing and stuff. And uh, I really enjoyed working with him. Uh, but I figured, you know what, I'll probably roll over Steve Miggs in this competition, right? And I was like, who else is going to be in my bracket that I that I care about besides Steve? And then I saw Matt, and I was like, son of a bitch. Like, I, oh, man. <laughs> so, like, I, like, I'm like, why, why do I got to face him, like, potentially, like, right away, right? And I'm just like, uh, Matt is one of my closest friends, and, uh, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this in the past. You know, um, I've always alluded to how, like, guys, like, Hogan, when I was younger, inspired me. And then as I got older and angsty, Austin inspired me. Um, and when I saw Gowan, he made me believe that I could be a wrestler. But there was there was a little tinge of doubt. And um, when I started going to independent shows in 2005, um, I had already known about M-Dog 20 through the Backyard Wrestling video game. And uh, I had... I had a cop. My buddy had a copy of it on the Xbox, and on the Xbox there was like this DVD bonus footage, and there was an interview with Josh Prohibition and M Dog, and I didn't know much about them, but in the interview, uh, M Dog was like, uh, "Oh man, it's great to be here in California. It's a lot warmer right now than it is my hometown of Cleveland." And when he said that, I was like, "Oh man, this guy's from Cleveland," and um, I connected with him right away just because like, you know, he's from my hometown. And at that time, you know, there's so many guys from like Cleveland and Ohio now that are on like uh, wrestling television. But back then the closest person you had representing Ohio was like Al Snow. And so to hear that there was someone from my hometown was pretty cool. And so I started going into the indie shows and when a couple of my buddies saw Matt Cross in person, they said to me, you know, if you like worked out like harder and you became a wrestler, I bet you you could be built like Matt Cross. And I was like, oh, man, like that that was like cool to think about. Right. And so back when AOL Instant Messenger was a thing, I um, I found M-Dog's screen name and I reached out to him and I wrote him and I told him my situation that I was uh, thinking about being a pro wrestler with a disability and uh and I asked him if he thought it was possible, and he told me yes, and we had this conversation, and he really encouraged me. And it's funny that you fast forward, and uh, I remember a few years back, we were talking about that specific conversation on AIM, and I remember Matt saying, you know, I remember you writing me, and I remember telling you that uh, you should try it, 
But now, if someone asked me that, I'd be like, don't be a wrestler. It's so dumb. Like, And it's not even just a matter of, like, your disability. It's like, you'll ruin your life. Like, just yeah. stay in school. But, like, for some reason, I told you to be a wrestler. So anytime something goes wrong, I make sure to text Matt or I tell Matt, like, this is all your fault. He yeah. encouraged me to be a wrestler. Uh, so I never give him praise when, like, the good things happen. I just, like, this This is all your fault. You've ruined my life. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, and Matt's always been a guy I looked up to. And, uh when I got to wrestle him for the first time in 2010, it was like a dream come true. And uh, I've had some incredible matches with him since. And just uh, just to know that I'm, you know, we're like close friends again. It's one of those things that's um, incredibly humbling uh, for a kid that, you know, grew up watching him. And just to be a, a friend and a confidant, it's pretty cool. And uh, it's just uh, very unfortunate that uh, I'm going to have to use my political power and my inspirational story to uh, eventually <laughs> take him out in this tournament. It's, it makes me sad, but, you know, uh, it's got to be done. He's already been in one video game, so it's it's my time. It's my time. <laughs> this, you got our vote, man. You got our vote. This is just like Beyond <laughs> Thunderdome. It's killed or be killed. <laughs> That's right. That's right, brother. Well, yeah, you definitely have the toughest bracket in this tournament uh, because right now, uh, once you roll over Steve Miggs, and I'm so glad that you uh, you talked about him because we uh, we researched all these guys today, and the only thing I can find about Steve Miggs is that he plays goalie for the Tacoma Donkeys. So shout out to the Tacoma Donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he's, he's like a, he's a disc jockey on the on the biggest radio station in Seattle. Yes, yeah, I did find yeah. that as well, too. And I was like, man, this guy's an interesting dude. But I'm glad you had a little insight into his wrestling career. Yeah, I no, mean, I if, if they were coming out with a video game about being a DJ, like, he would definitely be the favorite. You <laughs> know what I mean? Sure. Absolutely. If they had, a, if they had a, a video game about a beer league uh, hockey team, he'd be the favorite. But in yeah. this video game, Gregory, it's you, man. Well, thank you. I mean, um, there there is a lot of competition that I'm worried about. Like, I saw, um, I did see War Horses in there somewhere, and he's yes. he's really popular on wrestling Twitter. So I'm I'm very concerned about my well being if I have to come across War Horse. And uh, I saw that um, what Shane Mercer's in this, and uh, he's like a just a just an athletic physical specimen. So th- there's some guys in there that. Um, you know, I, I'm glad I got your guys' vote of confidence, but I'm a little scared as I as I progress in this tournament. To be honest with you. Well, yeah, but you know, right, go ahead. No, nothing in your career has been easy, though, and, and that, that's kind of your thing. Yeah, and it's like if this was like just given to you, like it wouldn't be worth it. It would it wouldn't be Gregory Iron. It, it, it like like the fact that this is hard is is that it's you. You you, you overcame so much things. And now you're going to overcome this bracket. Well, I'm going to do my best. And, and you know, you, it, you did kind of set the tone properly. I mean, like, my, my whole story is a matter of, like, overcoming these challenges, right? And it's um, – it, I think it makes me appreciate when good things happen that much more. And I, I do feel sorry for people that have never had anything truly bad happen to them because um, I do think that you need to, like, go through a pile of shit so when you get to the roses – like you, you can appreciate how they smell, and uh, it's it's one of those things where it's like uh, sometimes though I have those moments where I'm like, um, you know, like uh, I don't know if there's a god or something spiritual out there, but I, sometimes I look up in the sky and I say, do you really have to make it this hard for me? I mean, can you make it a little easier? Because I mean, like, like I, I I've been through so much already. It's almost like um, if God does exist, sometimes I feel like I'm his cruel joke. And so uh, I, I I don't know. It's it's uh like 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 I alluded to. 2019 was very rough for me, and it was my first year in wrestling. That um, um, pretty much the whole year I worked without a job. At the time, I uh, uh, I was dating this girl, and uh, she really encouraged me because of my busy schedule. She said, you know, why don't you pad your schedule with speaking engagements and uh, wrestling bookings, and see if you can quit your job. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, going into it it was a lot easier knowing that I had this chick that I really cared about holding my hand in the situation. Uh, and you could pick which hand that is. It's either the good one or the bad one. Uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, of course, uh, we broke up. Uh, and right as I'm, as I pad my schedule and I quit my job and it's, it's incredibly terrifying to fly without a net because I feel like I'm in this, um, very, odd in between place as a pro wrestler like I, a lot of people know who I am 
but I'm not like um, your Joey Ryan or your Cole Cabana. So I'm sort of like, and I'm making money, but I'm not making their kind of money, and I'm I'm staying afloat. So and it's been like that for a long time. So it's one of those things where it's like without the net of pro uh, of of a job rather and benefits from that job, uh, it's it's quite terrifying. But like knowing that I have the podcast now, which I'm I'm enjoying doing, uh, Iron on Wrestling, which I do every Wednesday, um, and I'm trying to monetize that and wrestling obviously and speaking engagements um it was something that i needed to do whether or not um a girl told me to do that um it just helped that she pushed me to that next level so uh yeah uh i i don't even know what the question was at this point now i just know that uh, <laughs> uh what i'm trying to say is everything is challenging and i wish it would get a little bit easier at this point but you know what it's uh it is kind of my gimmick that uh you know sometimes i gotta crawl through the glass to uh you know endure whatever it is i'm doing at that current moment Well, there's a couple questions I always like to ask. Uh, you and I were kind of talking earlier about how the wrestling business isn't always the most kind and easy business to be involved in. Nope. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, everyone sees the, the fans and the, the videos and watch, you know, sees the glorious interests and all that kind of wonderful stuff. But uh, it comes with the price, and one of those prices is traveling. Do you have any nightmare travel stories for us? Um, well, the, the most, uh, the biggest nightmare travel story I have is, um, and before I tell this story, I want to um, set this up by saying it's 110% my fault that it happened. Um, <laughs> but, but also as a sidebar, um, traveling in wrestling is hard, and, and I'll, I'll admit that. And I think every wrestler will admit that, especially the guys that like just put in the, the real long miles get on the real long flights, but you know what? I, I've, um, a lot of my closest friends really, um, complain about the traveling and it, it can be brutal at times, but I, I say to myself, um, things could be a lot worse if, if traveling and, uh, ignoring the fact that, um, you know, we willingly beat ourselves up for money. Uh, if you, if you disregard that part of it, if the hardest part of what we do is, we have to get in a car and, and drive for a few hours, either alone and listen to podcasts or listen to music or talk with our friends for a few hours or uh, get on a flight extra early and lose some sleep and we get to live out our childhood dream. Um, it's really not that bad. But uh, the worst travel story off the top of my head, uh, I was in a car with uh, Gargano, Eric Ryan, uh, Facade, and we did a loop of shows for Dragon Gate USA. I believe the loop was uh, from Cleveland to Chicago, um, from Chicago to somewhere in between. I can't remember where. And then it was from there to Wisconsin. And so then we had to drive through and then back home. So it was like a three-day gig. And uh, it was an interesting tour because I got to work with Brody Lee, a.k.a. Luke Harper, um, for the second time at that point. And uh, – yeah, great guy, one of the great, greatest guys in the business, and I'm so glad that he's out of WWE. He gets a, he he made that money, and now he has that opportunity to uh, show everyone why he's the best, one of the best wrestlers in the world now. So I'm I'm good on him. And that same weekend was the very same weekend that Uha Nation did a tryout for DG USA and uh, got a regular spot on the roster there. And uh, obviously he's Apollo Crews now, so like he he really busts his ass to get that opportunity. And I was there that weekend to see that, and that's someone I'm really proud of. But um, so we got through the whole weekend and as we're driving home from Wisconsin, we get to about Chicago. And um, th if anyone knows anything about me, I have a habit of getting flat tires. And that's mostly because I'm a cheapskate. Um, I'll get a flat tire and uh, instead of buying a new tire, I will buy a $20 used tire because – why would I spend a hundred dollars when I could spend 20, right? Like I, I'd go to this little Arab guy uh, uh, at the end of my street and uh, he'd say, uh, you want the good tire? Or you want the okay tire? And I'd be like, how much is okay tire? And he'd go, uh, 20. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, give me okay tire. And so, uh, so on this particular occasion, I think I had a flat tire like two weeks prior and like a cheapskate, I was putting off getting the spare. So we get this flat tire and pull off on the side of the road. And I said, guys, I don't have a spare tire. And they're like, <laughs> what? Now, so we had made like no money from that weekend. Um, like at this point, like 
Uh, it's 2011, so we're all about like five years in. Um, we're like making chicken shit. We probably spent all the money that we had on, you know, gas and uh, food. And so this was about midnight uh, on a Saturday or Sunday, and uh, we did. I didn't have AAA, and at the time, because we were we were so poor, I didn't have car insurance, which I do not recommend to anyone out there. I was driving without car insurance because. The car that I was driving was a um, was something that I was paying for monthly, and because I was so young at the time, I was like 23 or 24, and car insurance was through the roof for this car. So I was like getting uh, figuratively raped for for this car payment every month. And on top of that, if I wanted insurance, I think it was for full coverage. It was like something like $300 a month, which it was a matter of like, do I want to pay for insurance or do I want to eat food? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm going to eat food. So. Um, I didn't have AAA or anyone to call. Um, we had no money for a spare. So I ended up there. We broke down next to like a factory, um, which we had to like go over, like um, go up a hill to get to. And I said, you know, we're in a situation. We're young kids. I'll walk up to this factory. Someone there will give us a spare tire. And so we went over there and uh, we asked these people in the middle of the night, hey, does anyone here have a spare tire? And the guy left and came back, and he's like, no one wants to give you their spare tire, man. And I was like, oh, okay. And so we sat in the car, and uh, hours went by because we have no way to contact anyone. And, uh, I mean, we have a phone, but, like, the people we're contacting, like, they're not anywhere near us. I mean, we're in the middle of bumfuck Chicago. And so um, eventually a guy pulled up probably about six hours in, and he goes, oh, uh, whatever car I had at the time, I don't remember. He goes, uh, I have I have a spare tire for this car at home. Uh, I'll go back and get it. Uh, this guy leaves, never comes back. Um, and so uh, eventually a cop pulls up. And like, so at this point when the cop comes, we had been sitting on the side of the road not knowing what to do for like nine hours. And uh, I mean, it sounds pathetic. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> and so... Um, this cop was like, oh, do you have someone you can call? I'm like, no, no, no. Finally, uh, one of the promoters from AAW, Mike Pekovich, saw a Facebook post from, from one of the guys. It was either me or Johnny or Prasad or something uh, saying that we needed someone to bring us a tire. So Pekovich knew a guy who had like a car, uh, a car place there in Chicago. This guy ended up bringing a spare tire to us, um, putting it on the car, and then uh, – the guy goes, okay, you guys are good to go. And then he's, and, and obviously we had told Mike Pekovich we had no money. So this guy goes, uh, so uh, I guess got to know uh, which one of you are, are going to blow me now. And we all looked at each other and scared. And then he said, I'm just kidding. And I was like, okay, thank God. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, not just... gonna be, I'm not going to be that guy for a tire. I'll just walk home at this point. Uh, but we stayed on the side of the road for, I think, almost 13 hours. So from like midnight um, that night until 1230 the next day, um, because I'm an actual moron. So that's the worst <laughs> road trip I've ever had in my life. Oh, these, these questions always lead to great stories. <laughs> yeah. <really terrible. laughs> and then my other question I always like to ask, that's, that's a great travel story. Now, uh, <laughs> what, have you had anything on the road that happened that was just so unbelievable that it's like you're going to be telling this story until the day you die. I mean, Ricky Ray has told us a really good story about getting uh, checked at the border uh, trying to – or at the airport in Mexico trying to bring back some uh, performance-enhancing type supplements uh, uh -huh. at the airport before the increased security. And Willie Mack told me one time in New York – they're standing out, out in an alley behind the, the venue, and some dude just pops up out of a manhole and walks away, and nobody reacted. Like, there's just, <laughs> there's people everywhere, and this dude just climbed out of a manhole, and everyone's like, oh, yep, manhole people. It's New York. What can you do? <laughs> so, oh, God. That, that's horrible. I, I mean, I, I have to really think. Um, of course, when these questions get asked, like, you know, you can't think of anything off the top of your head, but I, I do know that there's been some travel situations that I think to myself, you know, like if I was just, you know, um, I could have done anything with my life. I could have stayed in school. I could have got a, just a regular job and like, I wouldn't be experiencing these things that I'm experiencing when it gets the most ridiculous. So like, um, around that same time period of that Dragon Gate show, um, actually it was that weekend specifically, um, Something had happened in, in the um, 
Uh, Dragon Gate used to do these matches called the Fray or or Fray. You can't call them the Fray because of the ban. So mm-hmm. there was called Fray, the Fray match. And uh, in that match, uh, Scramble Entrance would come out in intervals. And so Facade, who is notorious for calling way too much, um, was doing the spot where he had about 45 seconds to do the spot and he called something that was like two minutes long. So as the other guy is coming out to, to now start running his spot, running his spot. Facade's still running his still running his And uh, he, uh, 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 he ends up uh, screwing up the timing of everything. And I end up getting impromptu pulled out of the ring by Silas Young, and I wasn't ready for it. So when that happened, my ankle was underneath me, and I hit the ground and just landed right on my ankle. And uh, I don't know for sure to this day because I never went to the hospital because I'm a dumb wrestler. Um, I'm pretty positive I fractured my ankle because it instantly swole up, became black and blue, and uh, I could barely walk. In fact, I did matches for the next six months where guys couldn't whip me, and I just thought my ankle was never going to get better. And um, so to kind of talk about this other road story that, like, it's just insane when you think about it, um, Sports Illustrated wanted to do a story on me. Um, I think it was November of 2011. So this guy was from New York. He flew in from New York to Cleveland to kind of follow me for a couple of days. And then he was going to drive back with me to a Chikara show in New York. Um, I thought my ankle was good. I did this match in Cleveland and uh, opening spot. I try to plant my ankle and it just goes out on me. I can barely walk. I finish the match and um, I have to drive through the night to Chikara in New York city. So while I'm with this guy from sports illustrated, I have to stop, uh, I buy a bucket, and I buy ice. And while I'm driving, because it was my left ankle, I just had my foot sitting in a bucket of ice. Um, the whole car ride in November to New York City, uh, and I just felt like an idiot. But I also felt like, well, I mean, this will help for the story, I guess, because, like, I mean, it's, it's insanity that, like, this guy probably isn't going to be able to walk or run when he does this next match. But he's still in his car with his foot in ice cold water, hoping for the best. And even when I got to the show, I remember I wrestled Icarus and he wanted to call all this stuff. And the Sports Illustrated guy was documenting all this. And uh, I had to tell him specifically, I'm like, I don't know what you want to do, but I can't run the ropes at all. And uh, he said, can you jump off the top rope? And I said, probably not unless we do it in the last spot because I know my ankle is going to go out. And so last spot, I jumped off the top rope. It destroyed my ankle. It hurt so bad to do it and uh, probably didn't do me any favors as far as the healing process. And uh, then I drew, drove all the way back from New York City uh, alone with my foot in a bucket of ice cubes because I'm an insane person. That's pro wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to have a little bit of that insanity to want to get in this business no matter what. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, oh. Uh, it's for insane people only. Oh man, that is oh, those are perfect. Uh, yeah. So, I believe we are coming towards the end. Dave, do you have a couple questions, sir? Uh, I have uh, something. Um, I was just on the phone with, uh, well, texting um, the the owner of this uh, company I do podcasts with, uh, the Grangy Gathering, for you know comics and nerd stuff and stuff like that. And um, I asked them if it's okay if the Grand Geek Gathering endorses you as our favorite for this competition, which means we'll be posting it all over social media and stuff like that. And he said, of course we will. So um, I just want you to know that that company is endorsing you as well. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, man, your, your, your stories moved me. Um, I know you're a great wrestler. Uh, the company you keep, I know you're uh, – a good friend of Cole's family, which is kind of like my family because we go way back too, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I really want to see this, like this work for you, man. I want to, I want to play as you in a video game. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Like I said, it would, it would be a, a dream come true. And uh, it, it would just be another one of those things where, you know, um, it's just, it's just humbling and surreal. Like uh, as I'm sitting in my room right now, I'm like, um, I obviously have a shelf of like Hulk Hogan stuff, but um, you know, I, I, I sit here and I look at like posters that people have made for me, like drawings and like 
uh, action figures that people have made. Not an official action figure, but like, uh, you know, custom stuff. And then like uh, uh, Super Fun 5000 has made wrestling buddies of me, which they sell. And I have a wrestling buddy of myself sitting with my my Tonka WWF wrestling buddies. And it makes no sense in my brain. Um, you, you know, going back to the Stone Cold thing, like after we did the podcast uh, the first couple times, like uh, – he now calls me and I call him and uh, I ask him for advice and like we, we make fun of each other. And uh, if you would, would have told 14 year old Greg that any of this would be happening, um, he would have thought you were insane. Uh, but it, it's happening. And, uh, you know, I, I had a conversation with Johnny about a year and a half ago where I was talking to him about a conversation with Steve Austin. And he was talking to me about a conversation with Shawn Michaels and uh me and Johnny are like brothers, and I know how much uh, Sean meant to Johnny, and Johnny knows how much Austin meant to me. And uh, we just had this moment where we're like, uh, what kind of weird world are we living in where uh, we're best friends with Shawn Michaels and Steve Austin, the two guys that wrestled each other in the main event of WrestleMania 14 and essentially ushered in the Attitude Era, and he said, I don't know, man, but let's just roll with it. I, I said, yeah, man, let's just, <laughs> let's just go with it. Like, like, like It'll never make any sense. Um, but, uh, I, I, it's just, it's incredibly humbling. So to be in a video game would be just on another level. So, uh, what, what advice do you have for the, uh, the other dreamers out there that, that want to make this their, their livelihood that want to be on the big screen to, to be where you are right now? I would say you just have to take the first step and, uh, that, that's the scariest part about any dream is, uh, taking that first step, you, you, you often find that when you divulge um, your deepest, darkest uh, fears to people and you tell them what you wish to be, that the people that gave up on themselves early on are very dismissive. And they, um, they will tell you all the negative stuff because their dreams died a long time ago, and so they want to drag you down because they never got theirs. And um, there were a lot of people – that try to drag me down and still do um, despite all the stuff that I've done. And um, had I ever listened to those people, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. And um, I, I often think about that. And I think about the first day that I stepped foot in wrestling school and how terrified I was um, because I thought to myself, if I suck at this, am I ever going to be able to look at wrestling the same? Because I had such a passion for it in my heart. Like I thought like if I fail, like I might ruin my greatest love. And um, I know looking back at it now that like I needed to take that risk because even if I would have sucked, sucking is better than looking back and, and wondering what if. And so I would just tell anyone like take the first step towards your dream because life never gets any easier. Your dream will never get any easier, but nothing is more difficult than taking that first step. And if you take that first step, you've done more than 99% of the general population who have a dream. That, that, that's amazing right there. And right. I hope, I hope Charles sound bites that and we could just make that live on forever. Cause that was honestly one of the most inspirational things I've ever heard someone say. And I've had a lot of people say inspirational stuff to me. Um, Dude, you're just amazing, man. Like, this whole interview has made me so awestruck in, in everything that you said, man. Um, I, I'm so happy that we get to endorse you, man. I, I appreciate it. But I, just remember, I'm a dude. You're a dude. We're all dudes. And uh, I don't know. I like I, – I, I, uh, I don't know. I just I – just Good burger. Don't want uh, – yeah, good, good burger. Uh, I just – I don't know. I want people to realize that, like, you know, life is – short and uh that's so it's like such a generic thing to say but like life is really short and as we get older uh, i realize more and more how short months is and uh, how important memories are and moments and uh when i first got into wrestling cole you probably know this man like um it, it was almost like passe for like you to want to take a picture with like someone who had seniority over you or that was on tv because you know, supposedly you look like a mark or whatever. Yeah. And so when I, when I started out, like, um, and I wouldn't take pictures with people and stuff because I d didn't want to get made fun of. And uh, as I get older, I realize the importance of that stuff. And like, like, 
again, Johnny and Candace are two of my closest friends. It's like sometimes I feel dumb like trying to get pictures with them because like I don't ever want them to think like I just want to take pictures with them because it's going to get likes on like uh, Instagram or whatever. Like I, I like taking pictures and like having video moments with people because like one day I'm not going to be doing this anymore and uh, all I'm going to have are like these memories and these moments and if I can uh, capture them and let them live on long after I'm gone, that's like super important to me. So uh, you got to be able to like cherish these experiences and these moments. And if you can't do it while you're in it, uh, at least you can be able to look back on them and see what you accomplished because like, uh, I don't know, that's part of life. You know, if there is no afterlife, um, the only thing that we might have are the memories that we leave behind. And that's super important to me. No, you know, that's I, a great, that's I a really great comment. Go ahead. I, I really wish someone would have told me that that picture thing, but but like when I was wrestling, because I gave up so many moments. Like uh, before, you know, he passed away. You know, worked a show with Canyon, yeah. and like I really wish I would have got a picture with him. You know, um, yeah. for my my wrestling days, I have uh, one picture with someone, and that that was uh, Super Parka, which was my godfather of lucha and stuff like that. Um, but uh, another question is. Um, Char, uh, DJ Barbecue's son is uh, becoming a uh, pro wrestling referee, and I've no know, known I have uh, really bad moments with some like really horrible refs in the ring. Do you have any stories about that? Uh, the importance of a good ref um, cannot be discounted, and I think a lot of people, um, the the few people that have enough self awareness to say uh, they enter a wrestling school and they want to be a wrestler, and they realize, well, maybe I can't be a wrestler. They do one of two things. They either just quit because they just wanted to have the spotlight on them the whole time, and they were very narrow-minded in terms of, like, what it means to contribute to wrestling. You probably didn't have the passion if that's all you wanted to do is be a wrestler. Um, or they try to do something else, which I commend. But I think some people, when they try to do something else or they look at something like being a ref, they just go, well, all you have to do is count and stuff. Um the ref is so important, and um, I even feel like guys with experience don't utilize the ref the way they should. Like, a good ref should go unnoticed to the two guys in the ring, but they should also be enforcing the rules when necessary. And um, I think it gets lost on some guys that, like, that ref is, the, is there to communicate um, spots, essentially, you know? Uh, like, like, if I need uh, to change something on the fly and I don't want to make it apparent, by walking across the ring and telling this dude, like, do this now, that's what the ref is there for. I'm selling, I'm acting like I'm hurt, I pull the ref over, hey, I'm pretending I'm telling you something that, that involves me being hurt, but really I want you to parlay a message to this guy because we need to adapt and change. And uh, those things are very important. The, the ref can can be the difference between a good and a bad match, just like a crowd. Like, if the crowd is dead the whole time and they're not into it, like, uh, that could change the way the match looks and feels um, and, and I mean, I think the perfect example of that is, uh, Rock and Hogan, you know, like if you look at that match from WrestleMania 18, uh, it's not a bad match, but it's definitely not the best match in the world. But like, I think that match gets looked upon so fondly because of the way the crowd interacted with that match. And so, um, I think people discount the other factors involved with professional wrestling. Everything I feel is equally as important. Every role, like from refereeing to wrestling to commentating, like the commentators add the lyrics to the um, to the sounds that we're providing, you know, the soundtrack. And so, uh, yeah, like just to be a good ref, just uh, you have to create logic out of the illogical. That applies for wrestlers, and I think that applies for refs too. It's like this is, in our world, a competitive contest. So if you're not issuing the five count um, for uh, choking on the rope, if you're not issuing the five count for a tag team match or you're not counting the ten count on the floor or whatever, it, it, it all matters in the grand scheme of things. And, like, those little nuances can make such a big difference. Well, I, I can I got to say honestly, I can promise you that Dave's not bullshitting you at all, that you have uh, inspired him here because usually – I can't get him to talk to save our life on this podcast. He's over here stumbling over words, just trying to beat me to the punch. I'm, I'm just, I'm just a dude, bro. If, 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 you're just if, a dude, but uh, you absolutely are an inspiration, and I hope you know that. Um, it, it's something you talked about earlier. Um, you know how Zach Gowan uh, motivated you. Um, yeah. Is that something you think about in your career? That maybe out somewhere out there, there's another kid who maybe has an ailment or has, uh, you know, difficulties that they're going to see you 
and you'll inspire them to live their dream as well. You know, I, I hope so. Um, uh, it's again, it's weird because um, I think Zach often lose sight, l- loses sight on um, how many people he touched just in his six months in WWE, and I'm sure there's a whole other um, group of kids and. You know, there's other wrestlers with disabilities out there, and, um, you know, any one of them um, in the right situation maybe could have ended up wrestling Zach Allen or teaming with Zach Allen, and um, what are the odds that it ends up being me, right? Um, but it's just one of those things where it's like if you're driven and you're passionate enough and uh, you show that you can keep up and you belong and you work hard – um, good things can happen, and um, you know Zach could team with any disabled wrestler uh, or any wrestler in general. And um, he took a liking to me. And um, when I first met him, I didn't know if we were going to have chemistry outside the ring. And uh, we both have similar senses of humor. And uh, you know he's helped me out in a lot of situations beyond the ring. And um, again, I ju- I just saw him on uh, New Year's Eve and teamed up with him then. And uh, He's been doing a lot more motivational speaking, and just a couple months ago, uh, it was one of his first matches in months, and for this benefit show we were doing, he wanted to wrestle me one-on-one, and um, it's humbling, man, that like he trusts me, and um, to be able to go out there and not only to team with him, but to have these moments and matches where we can wrestle each other and show people that, like, hey, we're not just two wrestlers with disabilities. Uh, we're two good pro wrestlers. That's pretty incredible. So to think that there's someone out there that might hear my story and connect with me on a deeper level and maybe one day, you know, um, uh, I can run into them at a show and see the passion that they have and, and help them in a way that brings them to the next level. Um, I would love to do that. And that's, that's something disability or not. That's so important about professional wrestling too, that I try to hammer home in seminars. Now it's, um, it's not just about social media. Um, social media is so important, um, with connecting with people, but if you don't have the human connection when you're at shows, you have nothing. And I'd like to think that because of the type of person I am and asking questions to people with more experience than me and just being a good person, um, I'd like to think that that's put me in the position that I'm in today. You know, if I, if you don't ask questions, you don't want to get better. Um, how do you get better? Um, you have to do that. The human connection is important about above all else. Right. Very good. Um, we're getting to be about like the last seven minutes of the show. Uh, I want to ask just like two quick questions for you and then obviously give everybody the information they need to go out there and vote um, because your division uh, and the Dreamer division starts on the 3rd this Friday, which is tomorrow. Um, my first question, I just figured since I'm DJ Barbecue and I do a lot of competitions, um, you know, what, what what's your go-to food meal that gives you enough energy to get through the day? Oh, are we talking something healthy or are we talking uh, like yeah. uh... Well, I mean, you can go with it either way. I mean, it, it, it's up to you. It's the one that really gets you to get through um, all this work that you do. Uh, well, well, okay, so healthy is not as fun, but I'll, but I will say this. Um, when I do need to eat healthy during the week and I don't feel like cooking chicken breasts, um, <clears throat> I do like to eat sheets, which is um, – um, people are going to label it as just a gas station, but it's so much more. You know, you can get this made-to-order food, and um, it's good on the go. Um, I can eat healthy there. Like, I like to get a um, – they have this double turkey wrap that's super nutritious that I like to grab, and uh, they got a bunch of other snacks that I like. You know, some people will side with Wawa on the East Coast, but in the Midwest, um, it sheets, and I feel sorry for those poor, sad souls that have to eat that trash known as Wawa. Um, but on, on sheet days <laughs> – Shots fired! Um, <laughs> on cheat days, um, when I don't have to use healthy, um, you know, there's nothing better than a good soft pretzel or um, Little Caesars for a little bit. I, I love pizza, and for a little bit, Little Caesars, they're notorious for making um, pretty cardboard, trashy pizza, but I love pretzels, and I love pizza so much that for a limited time, they had this pretzel pizza um and it's probably, in my opinion, the greatest pizza of all time. But for some reason, they keep taking it off the shelf after a few months. They, they brought it out in like 2014, and they recently brought it back last year, and they took it away again because they're bastards. Um, but uh, they actually – I'll agree with you on that one. That, yes, that you were speaking true. the language of the three fat men you were talking to. Right? Yeah. Dude, God dude. damn, <laughs> little Caesars taking off pretzels. It's like the yes. McRib. They just take it away once we have that reach. It, it's such let, a let, let me man. tell you. 
if, if dude, I could get text message alerts for when they have that pizza, I would totally sign up. It's it, it, it's the most amazing thing I ever eat. Like jo- Johnny loves it. Ricky Shane Page loves it. Uh, you know, and and uh, it's one of the Gowan loves it. In fact, uh, when they took it away um, the last time, me and G- Gowan had this this conversation in a car ride where we were legitimately considering not only writing little Caesars, but like going to the corporate headquarters in Detroit and like protesting because, oh. and I've never done that for anything in my life, but I'm so passionate about this fucking pretzel, pretzel pizza. It's like, I was ready to like, that's just your next podcast, burn, burn Detroit down. If they didn't bring it back, you know, like I, I need this pretzel <laughs> pizza and, and little Caesars. If you want to continue to stay in business, you need to keep this pretzel pizza. I don't know what you're doing, but you're screwing up. And I don't like it. I'm challenging you right now to do a YouTube video. And do that. Get all you guys together. Do what, like, you know, Cody and and everybody else did that one Monday night raw, and just grab a limo, show up to their their headquarters, and start picketing <laughs> with signs and a megaphone, and get everybody all over there. Tweet it out. Uh, make it happen. I think that'd be awesome. Yes, we can. We can put all of our podcast money together, and we can rent a limo, and then <laughs> and then after what, what, with what little money we have left, maybe we can get some cardboard signs and scroll on them with some sharpies, and uh, really make some stuff happen. Right. Well, my <laughs> last question is: is that you were talking about how you know when you were younger, like the only individual from your area that anybody knew that was an inspiration was Al Snow, and we had Al Snow on the show. Uh, a couple weeks ago, but my thing was to ask you, how does it feel for you to be in that position now? All these years later, now you're the one that's the the homegrown talent that everybody looks up to uh, and that, you know, aspires to be. Uh, again, it, it's strange and it's humbling. Um, I, I, I love being able to give back and teach, um, but, I, but I'm still learning. And I think that's the beautiful thing beautiful thing about wrestling is like you never stop learning and uh, it's funny you mentioned al because uh this saturday um i'm gonna be in colorado and i'm running a seminar alongside al snow and d'lo brown it's almost like one of those things where it's like which one of these three doesn't belong because it's like you have d'lo who's done you know wwe and impact and you have al who's done wwe and impact and you have Gregory iron who has just been like a pretty known independent wrestler for the last 13 and a half years. So it's like, for me, it's like going into this, like um, there's insecurities. Like I don't want to step on anyone's toes or anything, but it's like, it's weird that the promoter contacted me and said, Hey, do you want to take part in teaching in the seminar? I think you have a lot to offer. And it's like, yeah, absolutely. But like, you know, that kid in me, that fan in me is still a little hesitant because like I'm alongside two guys that I really respect. And I, I, I don't want to be wrong. Um, there, I guess wrestling is subjective, but there is, there is wrong. There's sometimes when people suggest anything from wrestling that is absolutely wrong. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about that, but you know, again, it's just, um, it's humbling, man. And, uh, uh, I love helping young talent and, uh, give me advice. And, um, I think that's the best part of wrestling. And I think, I hope that's where, uh, the next stage of my career goes. Like if, um, Obviously, I'd like to get a contract at some point. That would make my life a lot more stable. Um, but if that never happens or if it does happen, um, I'd like that final step to be doing something behind the scenes because that's how much I'm um, passionate about wrestling, whether it be agenting a match, producing, uh, writing storylines and stuff, producing video packages. I just uh, I, I love wrestling and I love contributing. And um, I don't drink. I don't smoke. Um, this artistic outlet, um, keeps me going and, uh, I just love it. I, I don't know what I would do without it. Well, you know, I don't think you have to worry about not belonging. You definitely belong. Um, if you're afraid of being around, uh, D'Lo and, uh, Al Snow, you know, talking, don't worry about it. Cause I, I was, when I had him on the, the podcast, I was nervous. So, and you know, yeah. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're wrong, you can be wrong and that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for the information for this uh, Indie Mania for the Dreamers division, um, it will start tomorrow uh, and then go all the way through to the 6th, which is Monday, January 6th. Your round for this division in the Dreamer division is January 5th, which is Sunday. Uh, but it's going to be you versus uh, Steve Miggs. And we encourage everybody to go out and vote. 
Uh, and make sure that when you go to RetroSoft Studios' his Twitter account, Instagram, Facebook pages, make sure you go out there and follow the instructions uh, because a lot of people get confused. They, you know, have people share that and then they think that, okay, they're going to have to do it. Nope, you have to actually go to their actual post. Uh, you can do it on the Instagram story feed. You can do it on the Instagram comment, comment section, uh, Twitter, uh, and Facebook page. Uh, so please go out and vote. Um, gentlemen, if you don't have anything else, you I mean we can go ahead and go over there. I, Gregory, I thank you for coming on. I definitely gonna have to find out and re, re uh, listen to this and do that soundbite because that is an inspiration. I am also gonna have to talk to, uh, Mr. Dinsmore about getting you up to uh, South Dakota to Midwest All Pro Wrestling, uh, and have I, you I, guest I speak there because, uh, honestly, nothing but praise to you. Thank you, my friend. Uh, and you are an inspiration. Uh, Cole. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. I, I appreciate you, uh, responding to my text, and I appreciate even more that you remember who I am. <laughs> so no, thank yeah, thanks for doing this. Uh, like I said, uh, you're just, uh, you this is one of the best interviews we've done so far. It's always great to have a guest where all you got to do is just ask a question and get out of the way. So thank you. This has been a pleasure having you on. No, thanks for having me. I, I always get worried that I ramble, so uh, that's kind of my thing. A lot, lot of uh, brain damage, so. <laughs> trust, trust me, uh, be on a conversation on the phone like we are right now with uh, Dave and uh, Cole and I, and then they'll be like, oh, God, this Charles doesn't shut up. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, no one asked me for my my last words, so uh, yeah. Oh. Um, uh, I don't worry, <laughs> don't worry. No one really expects you to go to South Dakota because you know that that place sucks and uh, no. no one wants to fucking go there. But uh, oh. you re you really are an inspiration, man. And uh, keep it up. And uh, anything I can do to help anything like make a, a reality you know um yeah you need some transportation next time you come to california yeah. hit us up <laughs> yeah i, yeah, I would love but, that i appreciate it but uh you know i'll uh, help uh, get the word out there any way i can so thank you that means a lot uh go ahead and tell everybody what your uh social media accounts are so they can find you you can find me on twitter at gregory iron which would be nice if you follow me because i'm I'm almost at 10,000 followers, so I'd really like to hit that 10K mark uh, in the next couple weeks. And uh, I'm on Instagram at Gregory underscore Iron because some piece of trash took Gregory Iron and he's never on there. Uh, I'm on Facebook <laughs> uh, at Facebook.com backslash The Handicapped Hero, or you can just search Gregory Iron. And uh, if you can't remember any of that, you can go to my website, Gregory-Iron.com, where I'm available for wrestling bookings and speaking engagements where I talk to um, – Companies, organizations, schools, uh, uh, grades 1 through 12, doesn't matter, colleges. And, uh, of course, you can tune in to my podcast, Iron On Wrestling. Every Wednesday, I drop the podcast. This week, I have Tommy Dreamer on the show, and I've had guests like Stone Cold Steve Austin and Johnny Gargano and Kimberly and uh, a buttload of others, Effie, Dan Housen. And um, it's been great uh, podcasting and talking with my friends and recording and saving those podcasts for everyone to listen to, just like this one. I hope this will go down in history as uh, one of the all-time great wrestling podcasts. <laughs> uh, we share that sentiment. So thank you, Gregory, again. Uh, also want to thank DJ Barbecue for putting up with us and uh, letting us uh, just kind of give him a hard time and uh, for being our official punching bag <laughs> at Pro Wrestling Uncut. <laughs> so for Dave Tigerman Smith, and DJ Barbecue, and today our special guest, Gregory I, and this is Cole Dossing signing off. Have a good night, and a happy new year. Peace. This special episode for Retromania's Indievania is brought to you by KBAC.Rocks. Rock radio the way rock radio should be. Go to KBACradio.com and listen today. Jekyll and Hyde Barbecue, our brothers from another mother, they make barbecue so good. It'll put a smile on your face. Remedy Brewing Company. It's the remedy for what ails you. And Midwest All Pro Wrestling. Go to MidwestAllProWrestling.com and get tickets and feel the excitement.